Welcome to the Digital Dudes Podcast. I'm David. I'm Reed. Reed, we were just asked how long we've been doing this thing, so we looked it up. October of 19. Yeah. Yeah. So we're three and a half years in. Look Pretty at that. Amazing. We're yeah. professionals. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, like, I had once heard a stat that there were, like, uh, whatever X thousand podcasts started, started a day, and... Uh, like it was like 80 percent of them never get pe- into episode two it's like just wow into episode one. so it's just, just like how digital is like even like lower a, success rate than like small businesses that's where i was going next <laughs> it's like small businesses the chance of making it five years is whatever 10 percent or something something like that yeah and, it's like uh quintiles yeah yeah, yeah. and i look there was some other or no stat. no it's worse than that go ahead yeah yeah well and then it's like the number of businesses that make it a uh past five years above a million dollars in revenue is like something like down to 1%. And then wow. when you get above 10 million, it's less than 1%. I remember seeing that stat. Cause I was like, man, from this ballooning thing, it's like, we, if we would have seen all these stats in the beginning, we probably never would have like, taken the leap. Uh, and so like podcast. having kids, it's, yeah. especially for the, for the woman, it's like, there's a reason you don't hear much about what it's like to be mm. pregnant <laughs> or give birth, you know? <laughs> I do think there's something though with that one where it's the short term memory. It's like the people when they're in the middle of a marathon and they're like, I'm never going to do it again. And mm-hmm. then like on Monday, they've signed up for the next one. It's like, okay, yeah. some, your body does something. There's some weird chemistry yeah, thing. You managed to suppress it. Uh, but yeah, so three and a half years in. So happy belated or early birthday. Um, this time we're going to talk about, uh, we've, we've both been reading a lot of business books. Uh, you, I think, have picked up the pace on me, though. I'm behind now that I have Griffin. But you had finished Drive by Daniel Pink a number of months ago, and then um, you started another one here that we're supposed to do with essentialism. But I thought it would be good since our um, guest today rescheduled us. Again, this is becoming a habit. Um, we will not whatever. name names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, so since we're going to uh, whiff it or whatever, riff it, riff uh, the topic today, I'm two thirds of the way done with um, with Drive, and I I've always liked Daniel Pink. I remember I had told you when we went to the Better Up conference a couple of years ago. That's when I first got introduced to him, and I just was like, this guy, this happiness researcher guy, is super interesting. Um, I hadn't read Drive though. There's a different book of his I had read, but this one's all about uh, motivation, intrinsic and extrinsic. You want to give the summary? Yeah. Well, he tees it up pretty quickly um, by saying that since I guess humanity started, there's really just been three phases of motivation. The first was uh, just survival 1.0. So don't get eaten by the saber tooth tiger, mm-hmm. <laughs> procreate, um, find shelter, etc. And then the second um, that lasted all the way up, I think he said to the 1960s or 70s was uh, considered 2.0, motivation 2.0. And that was all extrinsic. Mm-hmm. And so simply put the carrot in the stick. Um, is reward based and punishment based, mm-hmm. and uh, and now we've entered into um, and when I say the era of uh, extra or intrinsic motivation, I don't know that that's fair. I think there's a movement still kind of taking place, but um, where um, it's not about you know the your goals or um, monetary value or the consequences of your actions. It's really about um, what level of autonomy you're experiencing, what level of mastery or or flow you're feeling, which is a, you know easy way of saying engagement within the work um, you know that you're doing, and then uh, purpose. So that's the that's the setup, and um, a little bit more is just that what he's found is that you get a lot more longevity and really better performance when you have folks and making this more specific to business when you have an intrinsic uh, organization. So the goal really is you want to be an I company, not an E company. So people that are self-motivated versus needing some sort of reward system. And he clearly, he sets it up in the beginning, uh, citing some recent studies that show you can give rewards like a, like a sales commission bonus, for example, and it will, uh, motivate people in the short term, but over the long term, they come to expect it. And so that can actually have a negative effect. And he talks about different studies where you've got two groups. One group is solving a puzzle and they get a dollar for every puzzle they solve. And then another group that gets nothing for solving the puzzle. And when uh, he leaves the room, if the 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 group that gets a dollar for solving the puzzle won't work on the puzzle anymore because they're not he's not there to give them dollars. But the group that it doesn't get anything. They keep working on the puzzle after he leaves the room just because it's curiosity based or whatever. So that was more showing how you can get people to solve puzzles if you reward them. But um, 
whatever, it may backfire on you. And so uh, he talks about like, hey, yes, it's okay to give people uh, like companies or teams rewards once in a while if they have a great quarter. Maybe you take them for a pizza party or something, but it's you got to be careful for it to not start to become an expectation so that the next time you don't take them on a pizza party, they don't like throw a fit about it. Um, and he talks about, he gives different examples in the book about how like, well, it actually may be just more reward for Reed to go over and pat someone on the back and say, that was a killer job versus giving any sort of pizza party. Um, along the way. And so I thought this was interesting for us because we had talked a lot about a uh, great game of business. And um, then we announced profit share for the company this year. And I was wondering how that may have changed your thinking about doing great game of business or profit share or any of these other things where we want to like help. We, we want everybody to think like they're business owners, but at the same time, um, have we accidentally now maybe set ourselves up to where we almost uh, are creating this e extrinsic culture, or uh, which would then hurt productivity long term if we're not going to continue to follow through on such things? Yeah, it hit me hard um, because uh, I'm comfortable disclosing like uh, we have an incentive as far as kind of our capacity. Uh, so or maybe simpler put, an efficiency goal right now for the company that would provide a 10% increase for every single person at Digital if we're able to hit it by the end of the year. And that is as extrinsic as it gets. Mm -hmm. um, I truly saw it as um, kind of a means to get to where we want to be as far as what we're offering um, our employees and what we're offering uh, candidates. So um, my qualifier here is, is that I wasn't actually expecting this to be the reason that we got there. I didn't, I mean, besides the initial reaction, I almost didn't want to talk about it all mm -hmm. the time. I've vacillated back and forth because a couple of times I've come up to Ryan, I'd be like, we still haven't mentioned this, Yeah, you know, but then part of me is like, I'm okay with that. You know, yeah. I want them to get there, you know, on their own and then, uh, but feel, you know, a lot of joy and excitement when they, when they are reminded, I'll say that we hit it versus banging that drum too much. Cause I think it feels gross and he gets way beyond gross and like starts to put stats behind it. Mm -hmm. One of the thing I wanted to mention as you were doing that uh, kind of summary of the puzzle with the dollar, I think it was with rubles because uh, he, he said there, this isn't just, you know, uh, United States thing. Like he talked about some of the international studies and one that grabbed me when, when he did a similar thing with the, I think it was puzzles is he said that there was no change between the group that was offered a few rubles and the group that was offered mm -hmm. a bunch of rubles. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was fascinating too, that you really don't gain that much more by increasing uh, the, the size reward. of the carrot yeah. Yeah, or whatever. And he also pointed out that not only uh, do you see shorter gains with extrinsic, but you also can in fact demotivate mm -hmm. um, because it impacts that autonomy where work is now uh, or play has become work, mm -hmm. which is you want the opposite. You want work to become play and you actually see people doing worse because they now feel that they're, this is about monetary, mm -hmm. like um, you're putting monetary value on, um, on what they're doing. It almost, it almost like highlights it for them that like, oh shoot, I am trading my life for dollars. Yeah. Like when you start to put it that way, it's like, hey, did you make X sales call this hour or whatever? And it's like, oh shoot. Now I feel like it just, it just reminds you that like, what You're working I, for the man. what's my opportunity yeah. cost by giving up this hour for those sales calls or whatever. Totally. Um, so yeah, I thought that was interesting. And then he goes into, as you were starting to point out, like there's three, he breaks the uh, motivation 3.0 into um, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. So mastery where someone wants to become a master of their craft, which I was so excited to see, as you know, like they just want to keep getting better and better. Um, at whatever they're doing. Autonomy is that they can work on uh, what they want, when they want, with who they want. So basically just freedom about the work that they're able to do. And then purpose is them being able to tie it back to some purpose greater than themselves, which again, like if you're working on commissions or bonuses, that is just for you. It's not really for something else, but he does talk about there are different ways to do it. So instead of giving a bonus to somebody, what if you gave them 200 bucks for their charity charity of choice you're giving them purpose in the work that they're doing but you're not paying it to them and so it's an interesting way to to think about it and uh, to sort of almost skirt around it we still want to incentivize the behavior they're just now working for their charity yeah totally and he talked about was it uh, tom shoes mm -hmm. um as some of the examples of companies and he went as far as uh i guess 
mentioning that there's now, uh, and I forget the acronym, but these for-profit um, or social profit companies. Yeah. Do you remember yeah. what the acronym I was? I don't. It's like, it's basically that you're still, it's almost like the B Corps. Like you're agreeing to still be a for-profit business, but you are doing it for the either greater environmental or um, whatever, a human good. Some sort of social cause. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that you get some benefit from that too. Um, but I think that's great. And um, well, it just uh, stirred, all, stirred up all sorts of thoughts, most of which probably are our vice president of finance would not want to hear uh, yeah. from us right now. Um, but where was I going to go with the, well, we, oh, with the, oh, sorry. I was just going to say on the uh, mastery and on that craft, uh, one of my favorite examples uh, that he brought up is if you were to ask two college students that are both taking French, why are you taking French? One mm -hmm. of them would tell you to get, it's part of my degree requirement. Mm -hmm. And the other would say to learn French. Mm -hmm. and he's like, that's just such a simple, but great illustration of somebody that's intrinsically motivated because mm -hmm. they actually want to learn the language um, and master it versus somebody that is just checking a box. Totally. So uh, going back for a second to your 10% um, um, salary increase for digital employees, if we hit certain criteria, that came at the same time that we said, hey, digital is profitable. So let's do profit share, but, which then if in one way, if they're more efficient, meaning the employees, and they can handle more work, then that means that they get greater profit share. But in this case, you had wanted to use as a mechanism because we're in the top 40% um, of salary pay for our, um, I guess, our comp set, right? So we're already better than half, 60% of the companies. But uh, we had wanted to sort of like get that into the top third of companies. So be, we never wanted to be in the top 10% because we, uh, we just felt like that was being too aggressive. Uh, but anyways, your way of getting there was, hey, let's put this incentive out there that if everybody can get to these numbers, then not only will you get profit share, but we'll also just bump everybody up 10% so that we're hitting that th top 30 percentile. So I just wanted to put some clarity on that, that it's already something we monitor, but um, we wanted to get even higher up. And that was a way to take a nice big stair step. Um, but I think like the... I guess what's interesting to me with this and Great Game is Great Game talks about when you do profit share, do it once a quarter so that they don't forget about it. I, uh, it's not, but it's not weekly that you're doing profit share, right? And it's also not waiting annually. So weekly, maybe too frequently, annually, maybe too too few. But I do wonder if there is something there with with profit share where all in, it's bad. It's bad news. Would Dan Pink say that, or would he? Is there any way that he could get comfortable with profit share or do we need to almost like tie profit share with like that the generosity component to where it's like well half of this is going to go to fiona forward donations or whatever and the other half goes in your pocket i don't know I, what's your thought on it yeah well i wondered the same thing and of course somebody that's run some sales departments i wondered what if there was no uh commission mm -hmm. um and you just went salary mm -hmm. um is he suggesting that that would be an, uh, a sales department that would outperform an extrinsically motivated or classically motivated sales team over the course of, let's say, three years. So there's some specifics in here or examples that I'll say I didn't hear, um, but that had me really curious um, to, to see how that would play out. For, for us, one of the things that stood out and I feel like this is what we're trying to achieve ultimately is we don't want compensation to be the reason that somebody stays or goes at Digital. Um, we want it to be mm -hmm. our culture, the work um, that they're doing, um, you know, the, the change that they're helping affect, that kind of stuff, which we've been really clear about. And so I, you, you nailed it as far as the salary. We didn't want to go top of scale. Some of that's also just being smart, you know, like practically speaking like with business it's like some of the compensation i think at any company should be based on the performance of the company you're mm -hmm. in real trouble if you pay pay people all 95 percent right. scale and then you're losing money as a company mm -hmm. so we needed some protection there but i very much want to get us to that point where people are just like i'm i'm good mm -hmm. it's all about the work mm -hmm. and that to me feels a little idealistic. Um, and the other par part of me that struggled with that notion is there's such a wide d gap between what some people feels mm -hmm. feel is going to get them to forget about money yeah. <laughs> and what others will. And even within the same job type. So I'll just use example account managers. You know, if we were to pull them, I think we, we could easily see a 30 or $40,000 difference, mm -hmm. you know, and what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. um, because 
I don't think it's again practical, good business to to race to the top of that and say that's what we need. Um, so then, how does that ultimately affect like the the talent that you bring in if you kind of try to strike strike that balance and be somewhere in the middle? Apologies, I know I wasn't totally zeroed in on that uh, profit share comment or question, but the compensation thing is super challenging for any business mm -hmm. and both uh, Daniel Pink and Jim Collins, because Jim Collins does the same thing. He's like, right people, right seats. And that would include not having people on the bus that are totally focused on money. Yeah. Yeah. So that shouldn't be a big part of the conversation when it comes to, you know, retaining and, and acquiring talent. Yeah. Well, I think you said it right when you don't want it to be the reason people leave or st uh, stay, because if you golden handcuffs, that's a problem because then maybe they don't want to be there. And then uh, leave is obviously you want them to make a fair, a fair wage. And I also like your point about obviously like tying it to the company performance so that it's not just willy nilly. Let's get, you were just pointing out how great it is. We have fruit snacks now in the kitchen. Like, <laughs> let's double our fruit snack budget. Um, yeah, I struggle with it. Uh, so let me ask it a different way. Would you say you are intrinsically or extrinsically motivated? A thousand percent intrinsically. Okay. And About. has it always been that way? No, I'd be certainly being dishonest with myself and on this podcast if I said that, you know, there wasn't a point and I can't tell you exactly when that shifted, but it did have a lot to do with when I felt like I was in a good enough place for my family, for my needs that I stopped thinking so much about mm -hmm. it. Didn't mean that I wasn't motivated if I saw that, hey, with a few more sales, you know, might be able to bring in a few thousand dollars more. But um, unless it was extreme, which is not typical, mm -hmm. um, although some of the upper management roles that you see in corporate America do put that extreme mm -hmm. carrot out there. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've read, I think it was Simon Sinek, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, the uh, moral fatiguing or God, what was it called? Anyways, the moral decay, like just where it mm -hmm. affects your decisions. And it's like, that's obviously not good either. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, to answer you directly, I think I've shifted from what was an E for a certain amount of time in my life, my career way more towards an I. Yeah, I, I, I imagined that was the story. And I think part of that is, as uh, we've also read from numerous folks where there's this happiness where it's like, once you make, I think it's 90,000 a year, you don't, the, the amount of happiness incrementally is like, just not even worth mentioning. So it's kind of like, once you make 90,000, you're, this is what the research says, right? Is that that's kind of like the maximum you're going to get from happiness um, relative to dollars. Um, so back to the point about the 30. That was probably 2019. Yeah, yeah right. That's yeah. Well, that's the pre-inflation. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's where I was going to go. And also uh, pre like all this media around, I think, young folks thinking like they should start earning six figures like right out of school. Um, and look, there are definitely I think it's back to like what what's fair, uh, what what is the value of a position, as you could imagine. That's how I think about things. But I was more um, I would say I'm, I've basically been intrinsically motivated forever. Even in school, I didn't care about getting A's or B's really. It was just like, is this interesting or not interesting? Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was a point though, back to the, that almost like moral decay when some of the comp plans, uh, when I was in sales was like, shoot, should I, I mean, that's maybe not the best thing for the customer, but the fact that I even had to think about it mm -hmm. and talk myself out of it started to tell me that there's some decay happening here and how mm -hmm. you could fall some, mm -hmm. fall victim to it. Um, and then to your point on the, the sales department, I think it is possible to have an intrinsically motivated sales department and not pay commission. Now, maybe they would get beat out in any one quarter by the extrinsic department, but I would be willing to say over the long term, uh, the company's going to be healthier to do the intrinsic. Um, and it's more of that whole 20 mile march thing, right? Like exactly. you're never, yeah. Yeah, never compromising. You always make sure that it's the right customer. It's not gonna be churn out. It's not gonna be hanging paper in the yellow pages or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I feel the exact same way, which then makes me wonder like, is that just how we, you and I are built, for example, or Nicole is built with the intrinsic motivation uh, or did we somehow arrive there? Cause I don't think it was a product of our environment. I think my feeling is the nature nurture thing is like you have people that are just generally intrinsically motivated. Now they could have the moral decay where they become extrinsically motivated in the wrong environment, if you will. But so then isn't it most important for us? Yes. To set up our system so that we are rewarding people based on intrinsic, but really we are just hiring 
based on intrinsic. Mm -hmm. Does that sound fair? Yeah, totally. I think the question about, you know, um, are we just naturally eyes or are some people, he does hit on that too, where he says, can an E become an I? And his, he said emphatically, yes. Um, I think he was trying to get at that point of we've created this, I don't want to call it monster, but but society of extrinsically valued yeah. again because think about how long this has been in place, mm -hmm. and so um, it requires, I guess, the the right company, the right mentor, or whatever, to have you potentially rethink or do some self reflection uh, to really tap into to your extrinsic motivation. Uh, that being said, some people find it way sooner, and it just naturally, you know, it does come to them. And good for them. That's great, you know. But so many of the companies still out there um, are motivating extrinsically, and so it makes it difficult, I think, to to kind of discover that about yourself. Because there's not a whole lot of the other thing I liked in the book is doing these uh, these audits. Um, so around autonomy, or around flow and mastery, trying to really like surface that within an organization, I think is super important. It's not something we've done yet, but I'm excited to do because, you know, I think there is, can't help but have some of the fear of like, well, what if I don't have a bunch of Davids and Nicoles mm -hmm. and Reeds, you know, what do I do with that? Mm -hmm. And that's something, speaking of Nicole, that, you know, she was part of her initial reaction when I said, I want to do this test is mm -hmm. it's like, well, we have to know how we're going to handle that. If we find out that for shockingly a digital half of our company is extrinsically valued. Well, to just half step Extremely back, motivated, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one half step back is your thing about how long the system has been in place, the carrot and the stick. And I, it, I actually believe it's only getting worse. Well, I could be, I could be wrong about it getting worse, but I'm feeling it more in the personal and consumer sense than before. So perhaps companies aren't as, um, who's the G, GE person? Walsh. Walsh. Yeah, I almost said Walsh. Perhaps not all companies are acting like Walsh these days, where it's like we cut the bottom, you know, 10%. But uh, in your uh, personal life and as a consumer, you're getting smashed with all these reward programs. And it's like, mm -hmm. even when I was at King Supers the other day, they were like, did you know you can double the amount of gas points if you just do? And mm -hmm. I'm like, I please don't talk to me about that. Like, I don't want to do that at all. But then uh, like Nicole's mom is addicted to these like apps that she scans her receipts into that gives her points back. Was that, that the Ibotta? You know, I think it is Ibotta. I think it's Ibotta's I, app. Yeah. yeah. And I, it's like, well, how many <laughs> of these receipts do you have to scan to get a $10 like yeah. Target gift card? It's like, no, thank you. Uh, so we send her our receipts sometimes because she just wants to scan these things for points. Mm -hmm. But that is clearly just like feeding the monster, right? Um, so anyways. Uh, it's then, that dopamine hit. Yeah, it, they do gamify it with like, mm -hmm. like little digital confetti and, and mm -hmm. all that. And that's the whole like, Problem, I think he talks about that stuff. too a little bit, doesn't he? The dopamine, where it's like when he's talking about the the rats in the maze, it's like if you, oh yeah, it it starts to lose its effect, and yeah. then you have to like, then where are you left? And that's yeah. part of his argument of like this is not sustainable. It will play its course, mm -hmm. you know, because eventually there's no amount of mm -hmm. you know reward that you can give that will actually change their behavior. Yeah, and I had actually watched a separate like Science Channel thing or something on. Uh, they were doing. Uh, rewards for birds about sharing food uh, is really interesting. There are these two birds in two cages next to each other. And it's like, you could give them food for doing a trick, but then you could actually teach them that like, if they help the other bird do the trick, that the bird that does the trick is going to get rewarded and then they will return serve back. So it was one of these things where it's like, uh, I'm doing a terrible job of explaining it like your rats in the maze, but they were just, it came to the same conclusion as like, if you just did it, only for your own motivation, then the birds would only do so many tricks for food. But if they were helping another bird do the trick, then they basically would never stop because they yeah. were, I guess, getting rewarded mentally for helping their friends mm -hmm. achieve. Brothers Keeper. Model. Yeah. Mindset. Well, um, I want to unpack each one of those a little bit more with you. Curious what's stood out. Um, and maybe since you're two thirds in, you won't have, have as much on purpose, but because uh, I think the first two he hits is autonomy and then gets the mastery. So, mm -hmm. What I found really fascinating, um, and it's come up also here at Digible, um, is on the autonomy front, um, how critical that is. Um, obviously, all three of these are. But that people um, don't want to be told exactly how to get their their work done, that that is a huge demotivator. Um, naturally, just about any job needs some direction to it. 
but the more that you can let them get to the outcome that you're asking, which you've been really pushing recently, it's like, let's just get these metrics. Let's make it really clear what we're measuring, what we're looking for, kind of that outcome statement. But what we hadn't discussed after that was, is what level of autonomy or freedom are we willing to give our employees to get there? And, you know, we're so focused and a lot of companies these days are on scale. So whenever you think scale, it's like, well, things got to run like a machine. Mm -hmm. And I've mentioned a few times uh, with a few of our departments that I've worried about, you know, we're, we now have built this machine and people are not finding gratification. They're not mm -hmm. finding a creative kind of freedom, not getting to exercise that right brain. And a lot of the people we hire seem drawn to that. And then we throw them in a machine. Mm -hmm. So it, that's another reason this one hit me hard. And he said, there's, I think it was a company in Brazil that um, had been the first to introduce what was called a row uh, workplace, which is a results only workplace where they went so far as back to your, you mentioned the three categories. I remember four T's or something to autonomy. Yeah. Time, team, task. type, or is it task? There is task. Maybe there's also type. Anyways, so these are the kind of ingredients inside of autonomy um, that you would be able to choose who you work with, when you work, what type of work you do, and I guess the the, the method, uh, you know, of, of the task itself. Uh, was bullshit, <laughs> I'll just say. But, uh, um, and I found that fascinating where you could actually decide whether you were going to show up for a one on one with mm -hmm. your manager or whether mm -hmm. you were going to go to a team meeting. Yeah. And this actually connected, and I'll, I will refrain from getting into the other book, Essentialism, but he calls this out big time mm -hmm. where it's like, why do people go to all the meetings they go to? Mm -hmm. You know, we're forcing that on themselves back to prioritizing mm -hmm. their day instead of letting them prioritize. So, I love the idea of this row, but I don't think Digible is ready for that. Um, but I don't know how far away we are from it. Uh, it was really interesting. And I think the company has had tremendous results now for like two decades. So Yeah, the row, the results only. Yeah, he yeah. mentioned some other company that did it like in 2008 as well, like as, and it was a U.S.-based firm. Um, and he said that they had like two people out of 22 people that left as soon as they did it because they just couldn't, they wanted the structure. But to me, it's like I could see how Row works really well for small companies. I wonder how how you can get that framework to work in a big company because you need consistent, the customer, the consumer wants consistency. And so if you're too free, it's kind of, it's hard to scale as you pointed out. But then also it's like the, how do you QA the work along the way and make sure that they're getting what they, they agreed to. Um, but, you know, I've been kind of a, a fan of that thought process of Bro for a while back when we were even talking about like, um, should we even like uh, force them to come in certain hours of the day or mm -hmm. whatever. My challenge with it, with the whole like skipping a one-on-one -on -one is I do think that there's a there's a, a thing of respect that you still have to also show your other employees. So it's like if someone, you know, is all geared up to talk to you about something in their one-on-one -on -one and you don't show up, it's like that is super disrespectful to me about their time because they're waiting on you and then you they wait, do they wait 10 minutes and then you don't show up and then they go back to work? It's like that's super wasteful. Um, and also they wanted to talk to you about this thing. So it's like kind of like a, it's like an agreement to me that like the two of you are going to meet at this time on the calendar. I do think that there's a, um, you need people need to be deliberate with their time, and there are many meetings that could be emails um, or many things that don't even need to be a, a, a whatever. They could be a memo instead of a discussion. Um, but back to your question, I liked the autonomy bit. I think there, I think we do here provide a ton of autonomy. Uh, but I totally understand. Like, let's be aware and take stock of where we're at, and say, are there certain departments where we've given less autonomy just because of the way it's organized? Um, on mastery, what I really liked is that he talked about it was um, mastery was achieving flow, right, and also always seeking continual improvement. And we've talked a lot about flow because uh, we've said, well, sh people should be given more time for deep work, hence why paid media and, and client services have Tuesday afternoons blocked, no meetings. It's like supposed to be deep work time. So I like the idea of deep work. But what I really like that Dan pointed out in the book was you can do very so – when you're early in your career, your flow state might be just like whack a mole tasks that seem very trivial. But then as you start to skill up, 
now those whack-a-mole tasks are no longer challenging and then therefore you you are no longer in a flow state to do them they become like friction or sand in the gears in this i just immediately thought of like the the account coordinators versus the ams because you and i have talked about that a number of times of like if you're a senior am why why do you get an account coordinator and now it seems obvious to me it's like okay because the coordinator might be getting joy out of these flow menial but seemingly tri more trivial tasks whereas the senior person for them to stay motivated in their position they need to do things that are more challenging than to them uh, but that other person can actually really like them at that point in their career but at some point they will most likely sort of graduate out of that once they've mastered that portion of the of it and they're on to the next challenge yeah totally um i'm going to come back to the autonomy in the row environment you mentioned it feels disrespectful if somebody comes in um, excited to talk to you and then they get an email saying that's not important, you know, yeah. or you're not important, you know, um, obviously you wouldn't communicate that way, but I'm trying to refrain from bringing if, if this book essential isn't it to here, but that does, it's a perfect example of the people around you setting your priorities instead of you setting them. And he claims that despite that initial fear and maybe would you would see some of that initial reaction of people being disappointed or feeling disrespected that that quickly turns into the opposite that they will actually respect you you know for being that thoughtful about your time and that ultimately yeah. that spreads it's like oh this is a much smarter better way to operate because otherwise they could be coming in and they're getting they're getting yeah. everything. You're yeah. getting nothing. It's like, I'm glad I'm here to talk to you, but I had a lot of other things that I should have been focused on. Yeah. I also think that if it's done right, you go through uh, initial, as you'd expect, pretty turbulent transition. But eventually, doesn't it work itself out with that person where it's like, hey, you need to show up for this, this and this. It's like, well, if I do, I will. You know, instead of I just need you to be there for consistency, the customer experience, for example, that we put so much, so much effort on, we wouldn't be okay. So the outcome would be really clear. Like we would give that to them. Hey, yeah. we expect to have super happy customers. Yeah. And if you're going to take these shortcuts and it leaves our customer unhappy, you don't work here. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think it takes tremendous amount of courage, um, a lot of visibility and, you know, you have to be prepared for some of the, the, the pain of that transition. But um, I, I'm super drawn to it. I, I also, uh, to your point there, I think it requires us to be super buttoned up because it's one thing if it's like, just trying to think of like producing widgets with X error rate or something like that is super quantifiable. Like, oh, we've got X amount of returns or something. For us, when we say, I don't know, an, an 11 star customer experience stealing from Airbnb, they always were like, how do we not do 10, but 11? Um, that you have to start really like defining and being clear about because otherwise excellent customer experience me it's so broad right yeah, so it's too big or ambiguous yeah. easier for us to accomplish in some departments than others like maybe production or something but um when it comes to client services that's where it would just be a good challenge frankly to make you know the cs team go through it to say could you define what an excellent customer experience is mm -hmm. and could it just be obvious like if you tested all of them independently could they all get it right because mm -hmm. then you could start doing what you're saying it's like uh where you kind of leave it super autonomous. Yeah, one of the last one on autonomy that I got a kick out of, I think I have this right. So again, you read it more recently. So tell me if I, if I messed this up, but that there was some study, I don't know if it was in Europe or in the States, but with uh, daycare parents that, you know, were showing up late um, mm -hmm. and, or were showing up mostly on time, I think. Uh, but they were, there were still some, some issues. And so they said, we're gonna fine you if you show up mm -hmm. late. And they ended up with more parents showing up late once they added the fine <laughs> than when they didn't have it. Yeah. Um, and that was one of his examples of proving like the concept, like the whole stick yeah. is that often will result in, you know, the opposite effect of what, what you're aiming that for. That must be in part three. Uh, I'd be super yeah, fascinated because when we were looking at daycares, I was like, oh, so it's only like $20 if we're late. All right. <laughs> and I was like yeah. considering like what's yeah. it really cost because yeah. they want you to pick up by four and I'm like that's not going to happen but if I'm at 530 what am I really paying for daycare yeah exactly uh, well there's a lot of great uh, and I appreciate that just really good research backing this stuff up just it's a little like the Adam Grant like uh, non-conformist or think again where just time and again he was able to prove 
this was the assumed outcome um, or you know expectation using a characteristic, and it it proved its uh, its proven time and again to not uh, yield the results that that you'd assume at least lo- I guess longer term. Well, go into purpose because uh, I know we haven't really hit much on that. That is the one that I'm sure you were really stuck on, and I would say it didn't solve it for me. What it did tell me was that there's not um there's not an obvious solution. How do you get Tom shoes? Like the employees of Tom Shoes, I mean, I'd be fat. I've heard so many interviews from Tom of Tom Shoes, but not of the employees of Tom Shoes. And do the employees think like, well, thank God I'm giving away a second pair of shoes? Or is, do they have the same retention sort of numbers that any other company would have? Because it's a great mission that they've, that it, meaning it's one of the most publicized ones. But I just don't know if the frontline worker feels that way. Or is it just really the folks sort of at the top? Well, I think that uh, that he does get, actually write to that and and says um you you use the example so maybe you have read this part but just where your bonus goes directly to mm-hmm. let's say a kid um new shoes mm-hmm. and so if you try to keep purpose at whatever the executive level or the company level mm-hmm. that you will fall short and so you need it for to find a way for it to, to trickle down and be more tangible to to your frontline employees and so that's where I think Silicon Valley's kind of been, I guess, thought leaders or whatever. But uh, there's so many different things now, like built into those or those companies, um, where you have options as an employee to figure out where you want, you know, your your extra, like your roundup money, if you will, uh, to go. And um, I would love for us to do something like that. We have some big ideas. We haven't even seen all all the uh, Fiona Ford like suggestions yet, but how we could deliver that. Um, obviously, I mentioned to you years ago the whole um, every impression counts. Um, but if we had just done that as a company, where it's like every thousand display ads that we serve, you know, there's a donation that probably would have fallen short. Um, versus, hey, each employee gets to decide. Right. Some, some allocation for those impressions that that would actually, you know, be way more meaningful. Yeah. I mean, we've talked about it, but it's like, do our tacos, uh, gratitude tacos, which basically people give out tacos in Slack. If someone, if, if they're happy with something that someone did, if like every hundred tacos was a hundred dollar donation to something, it's like that probably would make, make a difference. I like your point tying it to, could you even tie it to like an individual? So it's going to this child, this underserved child. Cause I, I just think, I mean, that's why they, all those <laughs> commercials on TV years ago about sponsor this kid, right? It makes such a difference when it's almost like a pen pal. Right. But I think the big brother programs. Yeah. Yeah. I think what struck me though about his thing with purpose is his examples were like, oh, this person, if they gave two hours a month, might feel purpose. Or if they gave $20, might feel purpose. Versus I think you and I often shoot much larger and say, how could you donate 30 hours a month or something mm-hmm. to, to this other purpose? Or, ten thousand dollars and that's where i guess i don't i don't know what the right threshold is because his example some of them were you know if an employee got to donate twenty dollars it's a good it that that counts as purpose to them Mm -hmm. yeah um well i now my wheels are turning just thinking about how how we can get past where we're at right now as a company but i think it's a great thing um to face i'll say you know uh again this is not easy to confront this intrinsic motivation i think if if you're a founder or an employer, because you don't really know what you're going to get and you're not totally sure how you, you're going to handle um, or try to improve, you know, the organization. But the first step is not to be, I guess, in denial, you know, and uh, just look the other way. And so um, there's a lot of things like that that you and I and Nicole have experienced as founders where um, it's it's been hard to turn in sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm glad we're doing it right now with the DEI uh, initiative. Um, and I'm you know, glad that we've been doing it as far as, you know, kind of the investments we've made in our employees, things like the four day work week, you know, it took a lot of courage. And to me, this is going to take some courage on our part, um, you know, to go through this process and hopefully make, make some improvements. I mean, obviously we feel great about the company, but um, I am prepared for some surprises here. Yeah. Well, I think part of um, something we get, we've learned that we have to be careful about is if we were to ask everybody if they had purpose, sometimes that causes <laughs> more problems than than what we get out of it because they didn't think about it. And then all of a sudden they're thinking about it. And now they're like, I'm going to go off and join whatever. Like, That's the courage I'm talking about, though, yeah. because you're right. You've, you've done that, dealt with that a few times mm-hmm. uh, here at Digipol with employees that were probably feeling 
good enough, yeah. you know, and then you challenge them and, um, you know, a couple of them ended up moving on. Yeah. I think that's actually what you, the outcome you're looking for. I uh, think it, yeah, no, I was going to say. Too, I, it, just sorry, real quick. If that all happened kind of at once, we'd be right. in a bad spot. You that's, know. Yeah, that's where I was going is we can't have everybody wake up and say, what the hell am I doing <laughs> flinging ads? Right. Uh, but <laughs> I do, I do think that I, I, any of those folks that have left for, you know, whatever, as they saw it, like their path, I, hopefully they look back fondly. And when someone asks like, oh, how did you get into, I just listened to this thing on the French Foreign Legion. So that's what keeps coming to mind. <laughs> that is like so far from purpose though. <laughs> uh so anyways, um, how did you get to, uh, into Teach for America? But, you know, hopefully we made an impact because that's something we've always wanted to do is like make an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, where I'm uh, where I'm going with it is I think a lot of times our we can sometimes when things are really good, make things not feel good because we're always asking for like, and what else and what else versus mm -hmm. as you and I just talked about with Margaret, like how do we appreciate everything we've done and where we're at. So I think it's just how you're sensitive about pushing up mass surveys to the, to the, to the company. I feel that way with these types of questions. And as we get that uh, new director of employee experience in here, I'm excited about that because they can then be very deliberate to say, okay, this year we're going to work on purpose. Mm -hmm. Right. And then they can run some tests against that. And it, but it's not like we're pointing out all the flaws at once. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I think it requires a lot of, I'll say prep and coaching from leadership, I guess, or, you know, again, founders, um, employers before you do something like this, because it, it could be a very dangerous, I'll say exercise, um, if, if you're not thinking through it and, uh, love the fact, Nicole, that was where her head immediately went. She was like, not that it would be a disaster, but, um, we need to be really thoughtful about how we're going to handle these responses. So, um, when I say these two audits, I think I already covered off the, on, uh, on the autonomy. I want to say it's just a simple one to 10, um, you know, on how you feel about how much you have within the job role that you're in. But then the mastery uh, and the flow was pretty wild. I think he said that these tests can be as much as like 40 check-ins in a week mm. where you ask yourself three or four basic questions. One of which is like, is the work I'm doing uh, mm -hmm. feel fulfilling? Do I feel like I'm being recognized and is it um, having an impact in the organization or whatever, something to that effect. And just keep asking yourself that and you can't schedule it like out. It's supposed to be random mm -hmm. or just at any moment you stop what you're doing and ask those questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on a scale of one to 10, plot that sucker out over a week and see where it lands. Yeah. I, that, I mean, that definitely hit me because it lined up well with Dan Martell where he wanted you to do it every 15 minutes. So it was scheduled, but at least like he was like, then at least like you've got your spreadsheet with 15 minute increments or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so you at least get the data versus often you just forget to ask yourself the question. And then he's like, anything that's read on that spreadsheet, because you said, no, it wasn't. You look for someone else to do it instead who may get fulfillment out of that. Mm -hmm. um, I did. My last thing here was, uh, wouldn't you also agree that that job titles also go into this whole extrinsic motivation. Like, would we, I mean, you and I have um, had these conversations before internally, but it's like, should we really have like job titles or should, should there be really like a, a, you know, I'll say junior AM, AM, senior AM, or does that cause more problems? Because aren't we now just sort of like perpetuating this thing? So then was, is Zappos better when we talked about his book, um, you know, where he was basically a flat organization with no titles. Um, so anyways, just wondering if you had any food for thought. on. Well, that. but he changed and mm -hmm. we may have to call in a lifeline here, <laughs> but I'm almost positive he went the complete opposite mm -hmm. and ended up going with lots of levels because he said that um, it is so important for people to feel like they're making progress that he introduced all these all these extra levels. Yeah, like the ten, I so think I, that was at the beginning of his journey. It was like there was a new type of work where there was no teams, no manager, yeah, flat, yeah. completely flat. And then it was like 10 levels yeah. because you need to show some progress every six months or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which made me like throw up in my mouth. Like, yeah. I was really disappointed to hear that. But of course, you know, they were known to have and still known, I guess, to have this extraordinary culture. So I can appreciate that. But back to perpetuating the problem, like I think, you know, that, that is a big, big example of that. Well, it's, it's what's really interesting to me back to like, um, I mentioned on a, I think it was on our anniversary podcast, but how, um, 
they, uh, now I'm starting to think of our company is a product for our employees and are we, do we have the right product? And you and I have taken a lot from Buffer over the years because they're super open with like how they did their equity options and their time off and their salaries. But even when you look at them, now they're, they're a company of like 50 to 100, but they've gone through some major transformations with those programs over the years. And um, so shouldn't we as a company, seeing that if we're considering ourselves a product, be willing to make whole sweep changes like that? But I, I would say I know we're apprehensive to it when we're like, oh, well, we can't go back on this or we can't change that. This is how we do things. So we're at risk of getting very stuck into I don't know, the 2020 way of working versus modernizing by making, hey, we had no levels, now we have 10 levels. Uh, so I think there's value in it, but it's that's the ultimate example, I guess, of us on leadership. If we show like, yep, that was how we did it, now we do it this way because it's a different time or mm -hmm. a different product we want to offer. Yeah, totally. I think it's so hard to build a company that that can, can move at the pace um, – not that everybody wants, uh, meaning say you and I in this example want to move at, but, and still deliver what you need them to deliver. So if we're constantly introducing change, um, even if there are people that are prepared for that change, you know, you're not going to gain any momentum, like with your customers, with your products, like there has to be a certain level of consistency or focus to me in order for a company to find success. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, settle with that when you also are in an era that things are moving faster than they ever have. There's more choices. There's a uh, proliferation of technology and data and um, everybody's challenging everything. It feels like, and a lot of people are finding success with different, different styles, different strategies. Um, it's, it's overwhelming. And so again, it comes back to balance. You and I were talking about that just upstairs, I think, but just trying to find instead of like, overreacting i'll say to some of these trends which i think it's it's hard not to do sometimes because mm -hmm. you do get swept up into them it's like especially for you and i like trying to paint the the future of this company it's like we want to stay ahead of things um but uh yeah if you're not careful you you can definitely overreact and lose your balance which um is really custom i'll say to every company right what does balance look at look like at digital is not going to be what balance may look like at our competitor down the street yeah it's part of our purpose statement right to be a role model for employee culture and progressive change i uh, that's what's hard is like what is the right amount of progressive change or how forward thinking how much of a role model because to your point there are um we could be going with whatever the diet of the month is mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and then it's like but then uh what we're not being progressive about is showing consistency and providing a stable work environment for folks because they're always like what freaking rug are they going to pull out for me today mm -hmm. um so i know we're working on this or you specifically are heading up the smack recipe this quarter so that would be interesting to see could we weave it in there to be like i don't know annually or something i uh, somehow we've got to get at it so that it's more clear about you know, how consistent, how consistent of a product for our employees we want to provide, but while also allowing for some major sweeping changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, last plug for essentialism. <laughs> Margaret would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's our facilitator for EOS up in Boulder and uh, recommended this book to Dave and I. Um, but it, somewhere early in the book, uh, he, he uses, he mentions, and it's not fictitious. I think it's a client or something of his um, was this voracious reader reminded me a little bit of us, maybe more of you, but um, both of us, of course, with our business books and out in Silicon Valley could not get enough of the Collins, the, you mm -hmm. know, the Simon Sinex, whoever, uh, Daniel Pink and um, and just just wouldn't stop and then couldn't make choices like yeah. And I don't feel I'm not trying to defend this, but I don't feel that right now. But it it's like if you if you're not careful, mm -hmm. that's what could happen and just became paralyzed and just couldn't make decisions. And is, you know, a little apropos as Ryan this morning, you know, challenged us on mm -hmm. the definition of strategy. It's, you know, what not to do mm -hmm. um, is as is important as anything. So good reminder for us, um, even my wife. Look, shout out to hashtag Miranda here, <laughs> but she was like, don't you think maybe you want to take a break and read something that's not about business? You know? And I was like, you might be right. It might be time, you know, for me to take a quarter off. 
it's hard but not until i finish essentialism <laughs> yeah. it's hard because it's like there's so many good things that i i just follow my interests and there and if you're on a kick where you're getting a lot of like satisfaction out of reading things like drive and essentialism then i say lean into it right mm -hmm. but if you start to like i got worn out a little bit um in Q1 of the business books, but mostly because I had, I was more on the, as I told you, reading all these books about product and restructuring that. And so my curiosity had to go over there. But then even this weekend, as I was picking up a new book, I picked up um, the Leonardo da Vinci biography. And I was like, all right, let's, let's try something out of the lane for a minute, mm -hmm, just see mm -hmm. what I'll get out of it. But yeah, I, it's more of like, I'm currently of the mind, like if you're curious about something, just eat it up versus like try to tamper because it's so hard once you get stuck in a rut it's sometimes hard to get out of the rut about like yeah finding interest again definitely but anyways well i hope you guys enjoyed our you know little riff session here on the intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation but uh, yeah the book i squeezed in between the two that i also will recommend that uh, daniel pink wrote was the power of regret mm -hmm. uh, i found a lot of value um in, in that so uh stay tuned for the next canceled guest uh, yeah. <laughs> making yeah. a few more book reviews. I almost squeezed in. There's a, there's a really good podcast from, um, uh, God, man, you were just talking about him, Professor Galloway. And it kind of like connects with this whole topic around like uh, motivating millennials and all this stuff. So maybe I'll get that with the regret thing. Cause there, uh, he had a really fabulous guest on. And I just loved hearing two like super educated guys mm -hmm. talking about like the current movements and stuff, but yeah. I'll send that to you. Very cool. All right. Well, catch you guys next time. Get, 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 get